I just didn't want to be in a position when I was 80 years old, realizing I'm just a cog in the wheel and not being able to create what I set out to create with my desires to be a scientist at that point in time, because I loved creating things. So I realized this was just a giant business. And in that moment, I realized I just wanted to do my own thing. I knew that if I didn't do my own thing, I wouldn't be able to create freely, or at least that's what I thought. I don't think that's always true. The ultimate freedom for me was being an entrepreneur, being a business owner. So I dropped out the next day in pursuit of a sales job, because I knew that there were some expensive things to learn about being an entrepreneur. Taylor Payne, I'm so stoked to have you on the Soul Seeker podcast and dive into mindful selling, growing your business mindfully. And one of the main things that I'd really like to discuss with you is this concept that you've put in your company, humanity over hustle. So we'll get into that. I love that so much. Taylor, welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. Man, Sam, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for having me. I'm super pumped to just chat today, man. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been cool getting to know you, your business that you and your co-founder started uh, called Speaker Flow. You guys help speakers grow their business specifically through coaching and CRM and coaching involved. I'll let you speak to that a bit more. But sure. one of the things that I just wanted to start with for the listeners, because I know there's a lot of people listening that are business people, right? Whether you're an entrepreneur, seasoned vet, or a first time entrepreneur, or someone who's got a side hustle thinking about it. What's so important in Taylor, you and I talked about this on your podcast is systems and SOPs, standard operating procedures. And the one thing that I really noticed back in my first business Swagworks was once I got order management system and a CRM in, implemented, I was able to double my business th three years in a row each year. And I directly attribute that to the CRM and order management. So that's why when I heard about speaker flow and I got a chance to meet you and some people over at your team, I was like, I'm brand new into this industry, but I'm going all in and I want to work with you guys. So we're brand new, like starting to work together, but you know, I've had some calls and just uh, excited to pick your brain. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, again, yeah. Thanks for having me. This is going to be super fun, but yeah, systems. I mean, it's, um, it's crazy. We have systems for everything in our life. You know, chances are the way you organize your kitchen, you wake up and make your bed and brush your teeth every day. Like we have these habits and these routines, these rituals, if you will, of our day to day lives, whether or not we coin them, acknowledge them, or even have them documented is up for debate. But we tend to lose sight of those in our businesses. And I think much like waking up and brushing your teeth, you don't really have that documented anywhere. You know how to brush your teeth. It's spoken through the verbal world. So we get used to that kind of behavior inside of our businesses where we just trap a bunch of stuff up here, kind of expecting it to be second nature to other people. And then we get frustrated when we try and grow the team or expectations aren't met or we can't remember to do a certain thing. So just find that system just alleviates the pain of having to reinvent the wheel every single time. So you can just focus on the things you love doing most. And I think that's kind of why we all became entrepreneurs. I don't, I don't know about you, Sam, but like when I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I wasn't excited or I didn't even like seek out doing the business administration stuff. You know, I wanted to solve a problem for people right. that I know I could solve. And it, then we realize, oh man, most of this is business administration. So how do we alleviate as much of that as possible to make our lives a little bit easier to manage? So what did your journey to entrepreneurship look like? Oh man, that's a, that's a fun question. It's a loaded one. I'll try and keep it brief. Um, but the long story, uh, story short is I was an academic. Um, I graduated high school, 4.3 GPA. 4. Point, wait, 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 pause. 4.3 yeah. 4. GPA. 3. I didn't yeah, know that's so it, possible. Yeah, it is. It's, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a marketing thing or not, whatever. It actually shows up on your transcript, though. Colleges take it seriously for what it's worth. But for like IB schools, I think International Baccalaureate is what it's called. There's also another one. What is it called? It starts with a P or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. There are certain programs with higher level types of courses you would take in high school that have okay. an extra 0.1 of a GPA you can get. So if you get an A in an IB chemistry class, for example, you're going to have a, you know, a 4.1 basically. So nonetheless, this can equate out to having a higher than 4.0 GPA. So nonetheless, I was fully decorated. I went on to go to college and I was actually interviewing for places like Yale, Harvard, Stanford, and I interviewed with eight Ivy League schools didn't get accepted into a single one of them, which is okay in hindsight, but I kind of had questions about that experience, you know, like what, 
why did that happen? What more could I have done? And nonetheless, this actually worked out in my favor because I was my senior year and I kind of put all my eggs in one basket. Like one of these eight schools had to have picked me, right? And mm -hmm. that was no. So that was the first lesson and I don't know, plan a little bit more deeply. <laughs> but it was spring it was springtime basically senior year. All of my friends around me knew where they were going to college. I had no idea. And so I was like, okay, well I want to be in science. So who has the biggest science budget for the previous year from a state university level? That was Arizona State University. So I went down there and then my first semester, basically, I started to network with all of the professors and all of my peers around me. They were doing the typical college thing you do when you're a freshman. And I instead was hanging out with my professors and getting to know everybody. And basically, a few of them introduced me to be a part of a lab. And by the end of my first semester, I was even teaching a college success course to other freshmen, even though I was a freshman wow. and I wasn't. And it was simply because I was networking. I wasn't special mm -hmm. at all, but these professors needed help. I found a gap and I was helping them out. And so this is where I really started to acknowledge the power of relationships. And so I'm in a lab at this point. It's my freshman year. And it's really hard to get in a lab when you're a freshman, if you're in the science world. That normally doesn't happen until like your senior year. So I felt grateful and I was spending all of my time in a lab. We're talking like 16 hours a day, plus all of the course load and all of these other, I don't know, um, I was chasing success, quite honestly. And so right. I was just losing all of my humanity in this process. And I didn't really realize that at the time. But one day I walk into my professor's office and he's got his kind of heads in his hands. And he's like 80 years old, has emeritus status at the university, highest position you could possibly be in, running the entire chemistry department. He's frustrated. And I say, what's wrong? And he goes, I'm just getting a ton of pressure from the university to bring in grant money for the department to be able to like continue the research and so on. And I was like, what do you mean? And then he unloads kind of the business of universities. As a professor, you apply for grant money, you use that for research, whatever's left over goes back to the university on top of other profits and so on. And then, I don't know, like in a moment, my life just flashed before my eyes. I was already spending more than 12 hours a day in a lab, and I'm a very extroverted type of person. You can imagine my personality might not get along too well with, you know, typical lab rats, let's say. And I just didn't want to be in a position when I was 80 years old, like realizing I'm just a cog in the wheel and not being able to create what I set out to create with my desires to be a scientist at that point in time. And because I loved creating things, that was the root of why I wanted to be in science is because it allows you to create things things and do research and so on. So I realized this was just a giant business. And in that moment, I realized I just wanted to do my own thing. I knew that if I didn't do my own thing, I wouldn't be able to create freely, or at least that's what I thought. I don't think that's always true. But in my mind at that point in time, like the ultimate freedom for me was being an entrepreneur, being a business owner. So I dropped out the next day. The oh, second wow. I realized it, I just stopped cold turkey, put in everything and I left in pursuit of a sales job, basically, because I knew that there were some expensive things to learn about being an entrepreneur, notably how to sell, how to market, maybe do website stuff, how to bring in customers, like ideating a problem to solve for somebody isn't as hard as generating the business to get people willing to buy from you. And so I kind of went down this whole path for several years of learning how to sell and learning how to market. And it's kind of where I met my business partner in the process. And once I got comfortable with those foundations, I started my own business, started out as a digital marketing agency and side hustles and things. And that eventually kind of moved into the core business that I run today, which is speaker flow. So that's basically the story. That's amazing. So you went from high school student, 4.3 GPA, looking at Ivy League, Ivy League schools to dropping out of college and you didn't graduate from college. I did not graduate from college. That's, that's amazing. Talk about a, a total transformation and shift, <laughs> right? Cause I mean, yeah. you know, there's depending on who's listening and what your belief systems are, but I think most of us are kind of in alignment these days that if you're going to call, like college is about the experience, right? For me, I being college, I don't want to say educated, you know, I went to Chico state and I don't like look down on smaller schools or anything like that, but I went to a state school and my uh, major was recreation. I lived above the most popular bar in town and we were top frat. So I did the college thing in terms of the experience, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think for most people in terms of college and like the education part of it, I would say very much generalizing, unless you want to be like a doctor or a lawyer or right, something like that. Yeah. 
yeah, we don't really need to go to college like we used to. And we've been seeing this for the past, I'd say like 20 years, but it only feels like it's starting to gain momentum in terms of like being socially accepted in what the past 10 years, maybe, you know what I'm yeah, saying? So yeah, yeah a little bit. Yeah, there was a lot of doubt I had too. I mean, like, I bet. I mean, it's still, this was like what, like 2014 or something. I think it was 2014 when, when I made these decisions, but you know, everyone around you says, Oh, you're not going to get a job. What are you going to do? Like I was working at right. O'Reilly at the time. Cause I'm a big car guy. So I like, but I didn't have like an actual sales job yet. Like, I mean, it was, there was, there was nothing in front of me at that point in time. And I, up until this point, I grew up in poverty and my parents always said the only way out of poverty is through education. And so like everything I knew all of a sudden was just over with. And so how, how do you get over like that doubt initially, but right. just pushing through it. So, I mean, even, even though to your point, like it's kind of becoming more socially acceptable, we're what it's 2022. Let's say that was like what, eight years ago, basically still a ton of doubt at that moment in time for me to be able to make a decision like that because everyone around you is saying like, well, you need this in order to be successful and you have this inside conflict about it. Mm -hmm. And so what do you choose, you know, your own happiness and your own right. desires or the pressures that you're under? Well, good for you. And at what point did you start to find your stride in business and sales? Yeah, um, it was actually uh, shortly after I got my first sales job. It was it's funny because like, um, I look back on my teenage years and it ha had I been given a label for entrepreneurship, I would have done entrepreneurship far before I might have even dropped out of high school had I <laughs> understood right. the power of because I was 13. I knocked on 20,000 doors in the town I like, grew up in when you were 20, 13. When I was 13, mowing lawns, okay. man, no one would hire Darn. me. I tried applying for jobs, come to find out only a few jobs will ever hire you at 15. So I had two years to like basically go before I could get an actual job. So started lawn mowing for people and I'm a big tech geek. So I started hacking like gaming consoles and selling mm. those to people. I, I don't recommend anyone do that, by the way, definitely <laughs> with Craigslist type of deal. But like I have all these instances in my past of like exploring entrepreneurship. And one thing my parents, my grandma, they always says like, you're a talker, you know, you got to find a thing where you're talking basically. So I think I found a good industry being in the speaking world at this point in time. But right. nonetheless, um, when I got into sales, it was this direct sales job. We'd go into different retail stores, generate leads for a particular offering a big box store would want, like Walmart, Sam's Club, Home Depot, and so on. We'd generate a lead and we'd sell it back to that business at a premium, basically. So mm. the revenue models, I'll go find leads. And I'll charge you for those leads for the service that you want to sell. And so basically the idea is you start off entry level, you move up into managing a team, you have an office. Now you start training sales offices around the nation. And if you do well, you go into corporate. So anyway, I get hired at this direct sales job doing this exact same thing. And I meet Austin. Austin hired me, which is a fun fact about our relationship. Mm -hmm. We've now yeah. known each other. That's for your co-founder. Our co-founder. Yeah. And man, we were just kindred. Like the second I met him, even if I didn't get hired at this place, like I knew we had to be friends. And so anyway, he brings me on his team luckily. And then I start selling and within the first week I outperform him and pretty much everyone else on the team, um, and generating leads. And it was very natural to me to like, just have conversations with people and identify problems. Like I have a very intrinsic approach to life. I don't really care. I have this indifference about selling, you know, like I'm mm -hmm. not, when I'm, when I'm in a sales conversation, my only goal is to help. And if I, we can't help, then I'll let you know about it. And so I think that philosophy and that way I have approached conversations with people really helped when I started kind of getting into it. But within the first six months, I was an account manager building my own team and together Austin and I built up an entire office in Phoenix with 25 different salespeople. Then the company reached out and said, okay, well, we want you guys to start an office together in Denver. So we packed everything up, moved to Denver, started in an office fresh again, built that up to 20 people. And as a part of that job where we were running our own sales office, they would fly us around the nation training other offices that were suffering, doing similar campaigns. Hmm. And so like Austin and I together hired and trained, I mean, north of 500 salespeople wow. basically. And I think we trained probably north of a thousand kind of given all of the other sales offices. And so we got not only good at selling and positioning things to people, the actual service we had to deliver for our clients, but also the recruiting and the training and the team building and all of those aspects. And so I found my stride in sales pretty early on because I think I had a um a gift for it that i hadn't previously had a label for mm -hmm. and now i was getting all of this training and understanding why maybe in previous part, parts of my life like the first semester of my college year networking with professors and getting into a lab and so on 
in in a way like that was selling i was positioning myself in a way that might be favorable but also helpful to them which is why i started to be in a lab and teaching courses and all of this stuff so it was all of a sudden it's like worlds collided i had all of these labels and reasons why what had worked in the past worked. right that's amazing and and pretty soon thereafter you started your own business with austin is that kind of like how did that come together in terms of creating uh the crm for uh the, your business now speaker flow Oh man. Yeah. So that was a, that was a journey. I think so after we were working with this direct sales company, we were invited to be a part of corporate basically. And they were doing some really shady crap. Like it was a constant recruiting process. They were teaching us as office owners, how to diminish people's base pay and maybe pay them slightly more commission as far as taxes go. And like, just, wow, just a bunch of crap that I would never, ever again, very similar situation to college. We both stopped immediately. Mm -hmm. The second we caught wind of this, we're like, we want nothing to do with it. And for a while, Austin and I, we went, I wouldn't say our separate ways, but like we, we did different things for a short period of time. Austin, I mean, we did everything from like serving papers, for example, or working at a call center or working for a software company. And so for a short period of time, Austin and I were doing separate things. And um, I knew after I had gone through this sales chapter of my life, I wanted to move that into marketing because the really cool thing about sales, you get to build these really awesome one to one relationships but it's not scalable unless you clone yourself a bunch of times, which is possible, right. but you're talking about reaching out cold to people and so on. And I was fascinated about like buyer psychology. This is the thing that I loved about sales when I really started getting into it is like, what gets people to know, like, and trust you enough to be able to purchase from you and not in a manipulative type of way, but like, what is the true psychology behind all of this? And around me, especially online, I just see these giant brands. And I remember seeing an ad one day for a multi-thousand dollar product. We're talking like $10,000. You can swipe your card and buy it right now. And I think it was like custom furniture or something like that. And I was like, how does somebody get an ad, build out what they want, never talk to a person and swipe their card in full trust for 10 grand? That's crazy. Right. How do you build enough trust asynchronously like that in that one to many type of way? And so marketing became really fascinating to, to me. And I realized that sales and marketing are really two peas in a pod. It's kind of the difference between walking and swimming. Like it's still mm. movement. The method of which you're moving slightly changes, but you're still moving in essence is the analog I kind of correlate it to. So mm. nonetheless, I got really interested in this and I started seeking out jobs in marketing. And I found this um, Amish furniture company that was looking for a director of sales which was weird to me because they sold only online. And I was like, what do you need a director of sales for? Like if you're a full e-commerce store. And so anyway, I applied for the job. I got it and come to find out as a really small team, like three people, it was family owned, really great group of people. And uh, this was selling custom Amish furniture. So very similar thing to when I first realized, like how do you get people to pay $10,000? And the average order value was about $15,000 for this type of offering. So the challenge is that the company was a little bit upside down. They were kind of hemorrhaging some funds and come to find out this was largely due to a lack of systems. And so I helped them automate and I learn everything I possibly can because it's a small team and I can be nimble. So I learned SEO, paid ads, conversion rate optimization, systems automation, email marketing, like all of the things that need to be done to run a successful e-commerce store. And we turned that company around to $2 million a year, 40% profit margin, wow. three people. And I worked 10 hours a week because everything was automated basically. That's it great. was sweet. Like yeah, I was just right. getting paid to do this job for 10 hours a week, but I was, you know, based salary basically. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I kind of reached this point where I was like, okay, so this could probably work for other people, right? Like, and come to find out uh, most business owners were clueless about website and generating traffic and conversion rate optimization. And so I, don't know, I started picking up some website gigs, building out websites for other e-commerce stores. And I started doing some marketing and this kind of evolved into a boutique kind of uh, marketing agency, basically. Mm -hmm. At that time, Austin had been working with a software company in the CRM world, basically. And he kind of noticed this behavior where people would get some products, a CRM or whatever, to be excited about it, and then they wouldn't actually implement it or use right. it. There's this behavioral gap, basically, of actually getting results from it. And whatever those reasons were was kind of interesting, but it was still hard to grow because you'd always have this ongoing churn rate, basically. And he was the vice president of sales for the software company. Now, on the marketing side, though, I started realizing that often business owners, even 
like e-commerce stores, uh, restaurants, like they didn't even have CRMs. They didn't have systems. Mm -hmm. And to me, this was innate. How do you keep track of your database? Like I don't have enough mental space to keep track of everybody I had a conversation with. So mm -hmm. of course you'd want to have a CRM. Which a real long. quick, real quick yeah. for anyone that's not familiar with the acronym CRM, customer right. client relationship management tool. So that's exactly what you just alluded to. It's a way to keep track right. of your leads, prospects, current customers, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. And so like one day I'm um, running the agency and a company comes knocking on our door and says, Hey, like, could you guys market for speakers? I was like, what do you mean? Like the type you listen to, <laughs> right? Uh, what are you talking about? They're like, no, no. Like people who speak, get up on stage and stuff. And I was like, do they even run businesses? Like, do they make money for that? Cause like I've been to conferences before, but in, as a marketing person, I would just get on stage for free to do marketing. Basically. I was like, mm -hmm. who, did people get paid for this? Come to find out, yeah, a lot of money usually five to ten thousand is low mid market, and I was like, oh my goodness! And so, and then you get into it; it's the highest paid profession in the world, and you're talking coaches, consultants, the thought leadership category, basically anybody mm -hmm. who wants to kind of speak to grow their business, either as a paid revenue stream or a marketing vehicle. They say, can you market for these people? And I say, I mean, yeah, why not? Like marketing's an A to Z process. They have a high ticket offer, which is great. And even as an agency, they pay us a couple thousand dollars per month and we get them one or two paid gigs. Like what could go wrong? Like, of course they would get ROI from that. No problem. We're not selling these putsy $79 products or whatever, right? Which is a lot harder to do than one-off big sales. So let's do it. What could go wrong? Apparently everything could go wrong because what we realized after getting into this industry is that very few people had systems and the only mm -hmm. job of a marketing agency is to generate a lead, generate a lead. It's your job to nurture it, follow up with that person and get it to a close and then feedback to the agency who closed and who didn't. So you can improve the process. Basically, it's not a marketing agency's job to sell or set up CRMs, email marketing and so on. Uh, but what's fascinating is these people were still running successful low six figure businesses without any of these complex systems. But what we realized is that these individuals, like before they could even make use of complex marketing and sales strategies, they needed business systems in place, a mm -hmm. way to keep track of all their customers and all of their leads and a way to do email marketing. And, you know, they'd have all these other needs because these are complex businesses. They'd sell books and swag online, which is functionally e-commerce. They'd need survey and lead capture automation from the stage and accounting and invoicing like every business. Like, I mean, all leadership businesses are are quite complex because of all the different revenue streams that are entailed mm. with it. And we just found out that these people generally thought leaders, their expertise isn't in business systems and technology and business administration. Like they're truly creative, highly visionary individuals who are designed to change the world basically. And we loved working with this group. We just realized that marketing really wasn't the thing that they needed. And also this is another conversation if we ever need to have it. But basically I was facing an existential crisis with a marketing agency. I'm a mm -hmm. very intrinsic person. I love working with thought leaders because I believe Sam, you're designed to change the world. And if we can elevate your voice in some way or another, that's a cool way for us to contribute to bettering the world. Totally. Right? A marketing agency, you make somebody money. What's the next question they have? Right. How do you make more money? Right. It's like, God dang it, man. Like that's not, that's not why I do this. And so Anyway, worlds collided. I found a deep love for the thought leadership industry, a giant hole in the market where people didn't have an operating system, one place to run their business, nor the coaching and guidance and training to be able to help them systemize their business. So that combined with Austin's experience, having gone through that exact same thing in a software company, we reunited and created SpeakerFlow as a technology implementation and software company to help thought leaders centralize their business under one roof and then systemize so that they can grow further and then eventually make use of those more complex marketing strategies. I love that story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that totally resonates with the existential crisis of like, what am I doing here? Like yeah. that's exactly what I experienced with my business swag works. You know, we do swag, right. And branded merchandise. And I remember one, uh, plant medicine ceremony specifically where it just like, I kept being shown from every different angle of what my industry is and what I do and all this type of stuff. And even though I've always felt like conscious in terms of the way I operate my business, um, for example, when the fidget spinners came out, you know, I think a lot of us remember those, that was one of the hot crazes several years back that everyone wanted. And 
I didn't want to sell them because I knew they were going to end up in dumpsters. And I also found out that kids were choking on the bearings because the bearings of the fidget spinners would fall out. And I just thought they were dumb and pointless. So I would call up my clients because most of my business is done through email or maybe in-person meetings. But I've done this throughout my career. Like say it's a dumb stress ball or whatever it is, I'd call up the client and be like, all right, let's talk this through and let's get something that actually is going to make more sense for you. So I've always felt good about the way I operate my business, but it was very similar to me where I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm contributing to more conditioning and programming and not feeling in, right. enough within, right? Because I had one specific client, I landed LinkedIn, one of my dream uh, clients because wow. uh LinkedIn, uh, it's, it's always resonated with me more than any other social media, uh, profile account, uh, social media, whatever, <laughs> cause I've always been more of a, yeah, platform. That's where I'm looking for. Um, but LinkedIn resonated because it was more business, right? So I land LinkedIn and then they wanted North face or Patagonia jackets. And it was just this whole thing where I realized, started thinking about it and like, we, we already have enough, right? Like we don't need another jacket. And I really noticed this one that we were out of a specific size. So then rather than getting a different color of the size for those people that needed them, they wanted to get them a different size. And I was like, that doesn't make sense because they're not going to wear the jacket. You want to buy like a $200 jacket <laughs> that someone's not going to wear. And then it goes a little bit deeper of like, oh, what does this brand North Face Patagonia, like you, whatever the brand is, I don't really care, you know, because yes, Patagonia does do amazing things in the world. But oftentimes when we look at our association to brands, it's to fill an inner void. And when other people see us, it's a status thing. And when I really started examining that, I was like, man, this totally doesn't resonate. So <laughs> yeah, that's uh, kind of been my journey of getting into this podcast soul seeker, my recent book, soul life balance and my speaking business. So I totally hear you. And, um, that's, that's amazing. One thing I do want to mention too, about CRMs is how you guys are niche to an industry. Now for anyone listening, that is an entrepreneur business minded, right? Like the riches are in the niches. And I think it's so important that we find our lane, we find a niche and we go for it deeper. If you're someone that's hearing about CRMs and you're curious to learn more, rather than doing a search online and finding Zoho or Salesforce or whatever it might be, if you can find something as specific for your industry, like what Taylor and Austin have created in speaker flow that kind of, um, puts it in a box for you for exactly what you need in your industry, that's when you're really striking gold, you know? Um, so to switch gears a little bit, it's not really switching gears because we're talking about, it, but you mentioned right before we hit record that your company speaker flow has a four day work week. And you guys, one of your main core values is humanity over hustle. I love both of those so much. Could you speak to those a bit? Yeah, for sure. I think it kind of comes back to like the, the days of like Austin and I, like we were, I mean, slaving away at this direct sales job. We're talking 90 hour a week, seven days a week, you know, at the back into the lab, you know, 12 plus hour days. And, oh man, you're just part of a different generation of belief systems of work, I believe, you know? Um, yeah. And we had our experiences in our own corporate kind of structures and, it just kind of felt like people were treated as cogs in a wheel. And it's like, there's the only thing that business is, is people working with people. And, you know, you also want to create a company like a digital marketing agency or a software company. Like how do you uh, find good talent? Right. And mm -hmm. especially as a startup, you're competing with some of the biggest brands in the world. Right. Like I've had, I've had companies like large companies come and poach employees at speaker flow and them say oh, no wow. to those companies. Right. So how do you structure a business in a way that really puts humanity first? And I don't know. It's kind of weird. Like I, this whole idea of like even having like structured paid time off where after your first 90 days, you get an hour of paid time off or what a day of paid time. And then the next year you're going to get another two days. Like you're awarded like your humanity as you work with a company. It's laughable in my opinion. Like, right. so nonetheless, um, when we started speaker flow, we were a five day work week and we started bringing on employees. We were still a five day work week up until about a year and a half ago. And then uh, one of the things I just enjoy doing is looking for the cutting edge of 
what companies are doing that's beyond what the standard is. And I caught wind of this idea of a four day work week. And I started going down that path and I kind of realized that, well, the whole idea of the five day work week was actually invented by Henry Ford. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I think we just passed like the hundredth anniversary of that or something. I, I forget the actual, okay. nonetheless, I went down a rabbit hole kind of understanding how the five day work week happened, how the societal norms happen, how salaries were kind of manipulative. So you can work more than 40 hours per week without having to pay mm -hmm. overtime and all this kind of stuff. And I was kind of even reflecting on my own life. And it's like, you think about a weekend, right? especially those with families, you work five days, uh, you're not home until let's say you work the nine to five until let's with a commute, if you're not working from home, let's say six. Um, now you're doing dinner with the kids, it's 830. By the time they're in bed, what time do you have available for yourself? Because you're rinsing and repeating throughout your work week, then you get to Saturday and God only knows what's happening then. And then it feels like by the end of the weekend, like you need a day off from having a day off. And also one of the biggest complaints of people in that nine to five world is everything is open nine to five, especially governmental things and so on Monday through Friday. So you need to go to the doctor's office, you need to take paid time off. Like it's just, it just sucks. And you have to validate that to a boss and all these things. And so anyway, all of this research combined and I was like, the productivity doesn't change allegedly with a five day work week, people are going to take less sick time, less paid time off, which is fine. I'm not really looking for that, but I want to give them flexibility. So Nonetheless, at SpeakerFlow, we adopted a five or a four day work week, Monday through Thursday, the entire team has Friday through Sunday off, unlimited paid time off, unlimited vacation, just give us a reasonable notice so that we have the ability to shuffle as needed and it, consider it done basically. And as a result, productivity increases. Everyone yeah. comes back on Monday hungry to get back into it because three days isn't adequate enough time to recoup for yourself and maintain your family and people have more freedom. And granted, we do have some um, differences, like for example, we're a fully remote company, so there's not necessarily a commute or anything like that, but that allows people like, for example, we have uh, somebody on our team that's a mom and her child got sick one day. So, hey, can I get a half day so I can go and like go to the doctor? Yeah, you don't even have to worry about those types of things. Like it's, it's so much more about humanity first over the actual business performance. And that's the philosophy. But what happens is if you prioritize humanity first, your business performs better than it would have otherwise anyway, because you're not losing talent, you're not losing productivity, you're not, you know, having people that are quiet quitting necessarily because they're exhausted and overworked and all of these things like you're, you're treating them as human beings. And, you know, I think like, especially as business owners, this is really important. If you go to scale your, your own organization, you got into starting your own business for some reason or another. For me, it was frustration of how the businesses I was a part of were running and chances are your employees and their past work experiences, they left their previous places to come and work for you due to other frustrations as well. And it's our job to acknowledge the fact that like, we as business owners aren't necessarily unique. We have our own goals and ambitions and want to have that soul life balance that you talk about, Sam, that means our employees do too. So how can you prioritize them to make sure that your business is human first. And I think that's the, I think everything we're seeing, especially over these two years of COVID happening, everything is moving towards a more human direction. And we're seeing companies that aren't prioritizing that suffering. And we're getting even more wind of this four day work week and things are act like, I mean, legislature, I mean, Ireland just ran a whole test for years, basically proving that productivity increases from this. And so we're seeing this wave come through of people being really focused on a more humanitarian effort, not even just globally, but also in the corporate world as, as well. And so our ambition was to be ahead of that, but also our, our third core, in no particular order, but on our website, our third core value is humanity over the hustle because there's there's no world in where in which people are less than profit at speaker flow you know it's yeah people are far greater than any amount of profit we could ever make because at some point money's freaking arbitrary man and it's our goal as business owners to find the intrinsic value of why we do what we do and i tell austin all the time we could be selling socks i don't i mean i like working with speakers i said that earlier but the reason why i really do what we do is because we get to build a culture and an awesome team of people and pr pr create a space that is on the the cutting edge of what workplace culture should be like. And that's kind of the most exciting part about being a business owner, in my opinion.
Taylor, I love it. That is uh, so good. That is in direct alignment with what I'm all about. So I appreciate it so much because that's a lot of stuff I didn't even know about you or about speaker flow. And I can tell you as a new client of you guys, like th there was something in our initial talks where like I, I felt it, but it wasn't like necessarily said in any of our conversations, but there's this like feeling, call it intuition, right? And yeah. when we mix our intuition with discernment, we, we can feel this. So I think it's so important that all businesses find ways to bridge the gap between mental health awareness and workplace culture. And that's exactly what you guys are doing at Speaker Flow with putting people first. And I even wrote in my book, Soul Life Balance, I have a section called Mental Health Over Profits. So it's cool. kind of like the same same yeah. thing right yeah we got goosebumps <laughs> there you go sometimes i call it spirit chills but yeah i'll send you a copy of my book actually i'll ask you after the podcast get your address and all that type of stuff um if there's anything that comes to mind for people that want to learn more about the, your research because you mentioned that you spent a lot of time uh researching what you just spoke about do you, can you think of any articles or anything else sure. like a good place for people to start yeah. So the first thing I would do is just start. This is where I started. Google the four day work week and YouTube four day work week. There are some incredible talks that were given about 10 years ago about this idea. And then about a few years later, they started doing research in different countries, notably in the EU, kind of doing different tests on whether or not this performance would be increased or decreased productivity issues and so on. So, I mean, honestly, those are the best places to start. I can maybe dig up some resources and send them over later, Sam, if you're interested of some of the ones I watched, nothing comes to mind particularly, but I just, I just spent countless hours trusting the trusted resources that I like mm -hmm. to find, um, digging through what the research had to say about the idea of the four day work week. And at this point, I was like, well, you know, let's just test it out and see how it goes. And now I have all the proof in the world to know that it works perfectly fine. And it's honestly the best decision we've made since starting the company. Um, but that's exactly where I would start is you use your own discretion, the trusted resources, you're going to see them pull up in the list of Google and YouTube and just start exploring poking around. And what I noticed is, for example, I think there's a there's a talk on this, a TED talk particularly, um, and they mentioned a bunch of like first or primary sources, basically of actual academic research that was done on this idea. And so I went down those rabbit holes. So uh, just let your curiosity roam free if you're really interested in the idea of the four day work week. And then secondly, um, Google five day work week, Henry Ford, and then you'll learn all about why the five day work week was created, what it was intended to do, and why it was more fitting for the industrial revolution and factory workers and why it is not um, conducive to the knowledge era that we're in. 100%. And yeah, when I was on your podcast last week, and we talked about virtual assistants and kind of my background, things like that. I don't think that's something that I brought up, but it's, it, I know I wrote this in my book as well, where it doesn't make sense to your point that we have like 40 hours a week. And then a lot of times you're just trying to justify your time. And yeah. as a business owner, what I discovered when I had employees versus making the shift to a virtual assistant based team is that oftentimes like say sales are low right now I need to justify my employees time. So I have them doing different things, but it's not necessarily moving the needle forward. And it's just because otherwise they're going to be just sitting there like twiddling their thumbs. Not that it was that slow, but at least in sure the promotional products industry, summer is very slow for us. So there becomes a time where it's like, you know, I didn't really have these tools when I did have employees to even think about it, but it, I did know like, this doesn't even make sense. Like none of us, they shouldn't be working right now. You know, I mean, for, so from a business point of view, it made sense for me to work with virtual assistants because it's output based as opposed to like, here's the time that you need to fill because we're paying yeah. you. Right. So That's exactly right. Yeah, I love it. This is all so good. Um, tell people where they can learn more about you, speaker flow, your podcasts and all the goods. Yeah, for sure. Speakerflow.com. Exactly how it sounds. Speaker F L O W.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn, LinkedIn slash I N slash Taylor Payne, Taylor with two R's. 
Honestly, just Google Taylor Payne if you want. With two R's, I'm the only one in existence. If you find one, definitely let me know. I'd love to find another Taylor with two R's. But Ooh, hit me up however you'd like. You'll find my emails, my LinkedIn, everything online if you want to explore. I'm an open book, and if anyone wants a conversation, I would happily invite it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Taylor. I appreciate you yeah. taking the time and be on the pod, and uh, we'll chat again soon. All right. See you later, man. Thank you.